It's easy to be convinced by talk show hosts, editorial writers, and politicians that American security hangs on the razor's edge and that the world is more dangerous now than it's ever been. But today's guests remind us that the facts simply don't match that narrative. In fact, they tell us the world has never been better. They're Michael A. Cohn and Micah Zenko this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, journalists, filmmakers, scholars, and more, to make sense of the big stories shaping public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Michael A. Cohn, a columnist for the Boston Globe, and Micah Zenko, a columnist for foreign policy, who together have authored a new book, Clear and Present Safety, The World Has Never Been Better and Why That Matters to Americans. Michael and Micah, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, thank great you. to be here. So, uh, you know, how did you come to work together? You're, 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 you're you know, a journalist and a foreign policy think tank person. Uh, how, did you, how did you come to collaborate? So. Uh, I guess it was about eight years ago, I was working on a piece on the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Soviet Union, and um, I, I, it occurred to me that uh, the interesting story about this is that the world is much safer, much better off now uh, in the 20 years since the Soviet Union collapsed. So I called Micah just to sort of talk to him about it and to sort of talk through the issues, and I suppose you could say from that a friendship was born and we became, uh, we started thinking about this idea a little bit more. And we wrote a, a piece for um, Foreign Affairs magazine that sort of laid out this argument that the world's getting safer and, and that we over, we over um, inflate uh, foreign threats. And uh, you know, sort of the rest is history, I guess. Well, this, this, the, the central premise sort of flies in the face of a whole lot of punditry uh, and a whole lot of uh, think tank analysis and a whole lot of testimony before Congress and a whole lot of pronouncements from presidents, Democrat and Republican. What is the basic case? basic case is that the United States has uh, engaged in a strategic misdiagnosis of what's happening in the world. The misdiagnosis has an international component, which is that the world is bleaker, more dark, more violent, uh, more conflict prone than ever before. And similarly, the other side of the diagnosis is that we miss, because we overinflate those foreign threats, we miss the domestic threats, risks, and harms that happen to American citizens every day. These are not things that come from Iran, North Korea, or migrant caravans through the southern border. These are things that happen within our own neighbors, neighborhoods and communities. And in many ways, America is a very wealthy country that's becoming like a developing country because of all these systematic problems. And the world is uh, consequently never been better for more, a greater proportion of the populace on Earth. So, so why the narrative that so many people embrace that things have never been worse I'm exaggerating here, but only barely in the history of civilization. I mean, that, that is one of the main narratives of, of our time. Well, I mean, I think there's a few reasons for that. I mean, one is I think there's a sort of psychology, uh, which is that sort of big, scary events tend to, tend to we tend to focus on those more. Um, and so something like, obviously, 9-11, people became very afraid about foreign terrorists, very afraid about the potential for another 9-11 style attack. And then if you see something even more recent, like this, this, this massacre that happened uh, recently in, in New Zealand, people mm. just look at that as some sort of emblematic of what's happening around the world. You know, bad, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. And so bad news kind of right. gets get more coverage. Good news doesn't really get a lot of attention. And the, the story that we try to tell in the book is that if you look what's happened in the world in the last 25 years, it's all about good news. It's about the global the extreme poverty rate going from uh, near 50% to less than 10%. It's um, people living five years longer than they were, uh, you know, 20 years ago. It's about people having access to health care, to access to education, literacy rates improving, people having access to, to um, sanitation. Um, all these things that, that, you know, 30, 40 years ago didn't exist are now defi define the international environment, and people's lives are, around the world are much better than, than they've ever been. In addition, there's, there's, there's fewer wars than ever. 
there are there's more democracy than ever before. Um, and I think that kind of story doesn't get told very often again because it's not a very sexy story. You know, country right. elected a, a, a new president and there was no violence, and you know, it's not really a big deal. <laughs> You're a scholar and you've researched this, so it isn't just you two people saying this and people are going to, well, they're just saying it. You back this up with data. Talk about that, because that really is what makes the case here for what you're presenting in your book, is the hard data, yeah, the facts. I mean, some of the notions that uh, Michael pointed to, in terms of longevity, uh, basically health and well-being, uh, education, prosperity, those are the key markers. And we look at the data basically since 1990 to the present. Using as a, as a framing point the Millennium Development Challenge, which was a post-Cold War uh, effort to try to catalyze international efforts to improve human life. And on almost every one of those markers, the improvements have been tremendously vast. Like 15 years in a row, HIV deaths have declined. Uh, the 650,000 people died from polio just 30 years ago. No one has died from polio in a few years. There are presently four active cases of polio on Earth. Right, this is an unimaginable improvement. Guinea worm will be erased in the next couple of years. Polio will be eradicated in the next few years. But these stories are never told because positive global trends are not discrete events that get public attention. They require historical context to understand. And so good news is non-news. Bad news is reported and elevated and amplified by public officials and the media, but when good news happens, it is never reported. Well, it's not just the media, meaning we in the media. It's social media. It's that media. I mean, it's Twitter, it's Facebook, I mean, all of that. Is that not true? That is part of it. And, and also, one thing that we talk about in the book that I think is a huge factor here is what we call the threat industrial complex. And this is basically the sort of infrastructure of groups and organizations, individuals who have um, a vested interest in making us more afraid. Like who? Who are we talking about? I mean, politicians are the most obvious example yeah. of this. I mean, you know, there is a certain, I mean, if you look at our current president, um, he basically, his entire message to American people is you should be afraid of, of, of immigrants. Right? And that actually does work with a good number of voters and has been successful with some voters. Um, but it's not just politicians. It's also the military. Um, it's also intelligence officials. And, and you know, have a vested interest in saying, look, we have th there's things out that are scary. We need more aircraft carriers. We need more money for intelligence uh, um, uh, analysis. Um, it's people in academia who want to get attention, or think tanks want to get attention to the issues they care about. If, you're, if, you, if you're, you say, well, things are great on this issue, but they could be even better. Mm, not so much. If this is a real threat to Americans. It's going to kill Americans. Then people pay attention to so it. So when you say vested interests, you mean in terms of their institution, the military as an institution. Absolutely. You mean people in these places in terms of their own jobs. I mean, you're, you're talking it's, about a self-interest. Yes, As opposed absolutely. to the common good. It's not just their, uh, I would say, their bureaucratic or institutional interests. But professionally, if you work at a think tank and you say the world is getting better, or if you're a general and you say, actually, the United States is really secure, we're surrounded by two oceans and two friendly neighbors, um, and we create threats to our own uh, well-being because of the way we have shaped our interests as global and undefined and unlimited, you would not uh, get above the level of colonel, right? And you'll never hear a general really? say that because you would just be sort of drummed out. So it's not just about your, I would say, your professional well-being and getting more resources to your own bureaucracy organization, but when that is the conventional wisdom amongst a group of people, it is very hard to say something differently. Yes. And there's all the strikes against you if you try to. So how do you, how do you fight conventional wisdom? I mean, your book clearly is one way. I mean, part of it is just sort of pointing out facts. I mean, the thing that's interesting, and I, I'm always struck by this, is that the, the, the evidence that, that the world is a much safer place, that wars have declined, that there's more freedom, people live longer. I mean, it's not, it's not contestable. I mean, this right, data right. Is, is, is sort of obvious, it's out there, anyone can sort of can access it. Um, and I, one thing that's always very striking is that when, when I say this on social media or say it in articles, people often respond by saying, how dare you? Mm -hmm. Look what's happening in this place, what's happening in that place. You're, 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 you're being complacent. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just, you know, we can, we can think that there are major issues we need to deal with, and there are major issues, things like climate change for, is obviously comes, comes to mind. But you, you can start from the, the, the vantage point that We've made a lot of progress on things that 20, 30 years ago people thought we would never make progress on. And I remember, you know, 20 years ago people talking about the, the AIDS epidemic and suggesting that it would, it would ravage Sub-Saharan Africa, it would ravage uh, the former Soviet Union, and we've made significant progress in, in, in dealing with that epidemic. So I think, you know, it's important the to look... The same is true with Ebola as well, which was another yeah, one. Yeah, it's a great example. Incredible threats, oh my God, we're all gonna die. I mean, Absolutely. I remember hearing that li almost literally on, on talk radio and other places. We, we have an entire section of our book about Ebola, uh, 
because in 2014, 2015, otherwise known as Fearbola. Fearbola. <laughs> <laughs> Ebola was the toxic combination. I don't need to laugh, but, but, it, but it's funny. It's, in, it's in a good, it's a descript a good yeah. descriptor of what happened. It's a toxic combination of xenophobia, racism, lack of clear science, and the weaponization as a political issue, right? Basically, to 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 mischaracterize uh, foreign. Foreign, individuals who are foreign to the United States. Yeah, um, absolutely. And if, what the interesting thing is that if you go back and read the headlines and the chyrons and the way it was discussed, it is laughable. Four Americans tragically contracted Ebola. One was deceased. What the story that is never told, though, is how Ebola was defeated, which was a multilateral effort led by regional governments, nonprofits, the U.S. Army, uh, regional militaries for $2.5 billion dollars it was killed, and by December 2016, the, v the World Health Organization announced a vaccine to defeat it. When it was defeated, it received no news, because that's a positive trend. When it was uh, elevated as a threat and a risk, it received constant attention, but you literally couldn't, you literally cannot read about its defeat. So, you know, there's one of the things that emerges to me from the book is that there, I don't think that you defend it explicitly, and I don't think you name it, but there's a defense of globalization. Right, that, that some of the, these trends that we're talking about are about sort of the, the sharing of wealth and knowledge and connectivity across the planet. But the other thing that you seem to, 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 to pin some of this progress on is the international system that was built since 1945. Talk about both of those pieces for a second. So one of the, th I mean, this is the thing that's sort of interesting to us. I mean, if you look at the era after the Cold War, there was a, gr um, there was a great deal more consensus among international actors about basic international norms, basic international uh, um, uh, approaches. And, and in a sense, we, Mike mentioned the Millennial Development Goals. This was something that countries around the world came together and said, we want to you know, reduce hunger. We want to uh, reduce in, uh, uh, maternal mortality. Uh, we want to increase access to health care. And this was a multilateral effort, international organizations, regional organizations, governments, uh, nonprofits working together to solve these, these issues. And um, I, I think it's one of these things that's sort of interesting that that, 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 ele that progress and that is, is really where the result of international system that kind of um, encourages this sort of cooperation and encourages countries to work together toward these goals and there's also a political element too I mean I, you look back at what happened when, when Russia invaded Crimea mm -hmm. a couple of years ago um, you know the international community basically came together uh, uh, sanctioned Russia for what they had done imposed economic costs on them uh, and I think that's a big change too that didn't happen you know 30, 40 years ago before the, uh, the end of the Cold War. So it's a lot more difficult for, sort of, for countries to act outside the international system, um, unless you have a president who doesn't care about the international system and basically encourages countries or encourages authoritarian leaders to do things that really violate basic human rights norms, basic democratic norms. And that's what I think is concerning to us and what's happening now is that you know, we need a president and we need a, a government that's basically saying to, you know, trying to uphold these norms, we don't have that right now. Mm -hmm. So you've given us a lot of good examples, polio, Ebola, longevity of things that are good, wars. I mean, you talk to the greatest generation and they know what it means to have war. Give us another example of something, the good news, as it were, that we, that, that's in your book. Well, I mean, democracy is one of the most challenging good news stories we have because there are still 25% more free countries since the end of the Cold War today. Although, according to Freedom House, which is like the best sort of compiler of this, mm. democracy as an overall score has diminished for about 10 to 12 straight years. But if you look at actual uh, rights that people experience, even in non-democratic countries, they experience greater rights. Um, and if you're, if you're, people are really interested in digging down on this, there's something called the Polity data set. Polity is basically the best standard for democratization. They have scores from minus 10 to plus 10. Minus 10 is North Korea, plus 10 is Sweden. So just imagine that on a scale. <laughs> In 1990, the average uh, person on Earth lived in a minus 0.5 country. That's the equivalent of Afghanistan today. Today, the average person on Earth lives in a 4.3 plus 4.3 country. That's the equivalent of Guinea-Bissau. So even as we've seen uh, market decreases in democracy, the average person experiences greater freedoms, rights, um, than they ever have before in history, even as they've declined uh, in overall democracy numbers recently. Um, I think one of the things that we mis mistake um, for contemporary events is that it's what's called rosy recollection bias. We imagine. I love the term. I don't even know what it means yet. <laughs> we, because we know how the past turned out and we have hindsight bias, we imagine that the past was a much better place to live in. And a lot of people describe the Cold War, for example, as being a very stable, predictable era, and we knew who the enemy was and everything was great. 
the Cold War was a vastly worse place to live for everybody yeah. on the earth. Yep. It was a vastly more violent place, far more famines, far more genocides, far more wars of all types, and that is completely forgotten. And the overriding threat and was horrendous to, yes. e to even contemplate. Yeah, I mean, from, from nuclear weapons. Um, right. the, the story about, about war is actually, I think, the most fascinating story that people just don't talk about very much. Um, you know, for most of human history, uh, war was the defining sort of characteristic of how, how peoples and states interacted with each other. Mm -hmm. And interstate war in particular was a defining characteristic. Interstate war, I mean, war between two different states, has basically disappeared since the end of the Cold War. Uh, it, happens, it happens very, very rarely. In fact, when it happens often, it's the U.S. that starts those wars, like in, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, and that decline, in, in addition to a 70-year disappearance in great power conflict, has meant that that war hap, hap, wars happen much, much less regularly than they did in the past, and they're much less violent than the past. And that is an enormous change in, in, the, in the human experience, because for much of, uh, of human history, people preparing for war or dealing with wars or, you know, planning for the next war or remembering the last war, I mean, the war, that, conflict was, was sort of endemic. It's no longer the case. And you have vast swaths of the world mostly outside the Middle East, in which war doesn't, doesn't really exist much at all. Right, and, and just to, to, to point to Michael's final point, we see most of the world, the United States, to the Middle East and North Africa. Yeah. The Middle East and North Africa combined is less than 5% of the global population. Mm -hmm. So if you're overrepresented by an area of endemic conflict and violence, and that is what you think is happening in the world, you're missing 95% of the story. And just to give a data point to the relative decrease in war, since 1800, basically the number of civilians and, not, and combatants who have died in war has, has decreased vastly. So it's not just that people experience less war and they're less violent, fewer people are casualties or fatalities. And the consequence of that, you have a more predictable, stable society where things like marketplace and education and infrastructure and improvements in overall life are allowed to flourish. So let me ask you this question. So you know, one of the premises of the show is that story, narrative, tends to trump facts. You've got a great marshalling of facts and evidence here that the world is safer, more peaceful, more democratic, freer than it's ever been in history. How does that play out politically? Because the story that we are told left, right, and center is that we're not. Right. And, and you know, we, we, we've talked, you and I talked when we were getting ready for the show about uh, my old boss John Kerry in 2004 yes. saying you can manage terrorism, uh, you don't have to fight wars with it. Um, and he got clobbered for that. And it was a, one of the smartest things he ever said. I mean, he basically said that you should think of terrorism as a nuisance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a good way to think about it. I mean, actually, nuisance is probably overstating the threat from terrorism. Um, the numbers are in the, in the less than 100 as far as number of people killed in America each year um, since 9-11 from, from terrorism. Comparatively speaking, more people die probably in a day or day and a half from gun violence in the U.S. Um, then you mean die home, from homegrown gun violence. Yes, it could yeah, be suicide, yeah, right. could be accidents, yeah, yeah, yeah. could yeah. be murders. Yeah. Um, more people will die from that. About 80, 80, 90 people die every single day in gun violence in the U.S. That's usually more than the number of people die in the U.S. from terrorist attacks. Um, in the course of a year. In the course of a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, it, it's one of these things where, but I think the problem is that people have a hard time understanding that and a hard time recognizing that. I mean, again, I. Social media is an imperfect you know, indicator, but, but you always hear people say, well, what about Syria? What about Yemen? And those are awful tragedies. I mean, I, I'm not in terms of trying to minimize them, but they are the uh, exception to the rule. And in most places in the world, that kind of conflict is not, does, not, does not define uh, any, any particular region. I mean, it defines the Middle East, but, but that is, again, the outlier from where, what's happening in the rest of the world. Did, did you get into demographically who embraces the narrative, which is not true, that the world has never been worse. Or well, the, the demographic is all of us. <laughs> we, are, we are prone to more vividly remember threatening information than positive information. It imprints deeper, and we're also, there's something called immediacy bias, things that we've seen or heard recently uh, imprint deeper than things uh, that have occurred over time that require historical knowledge and context. So the, the biggest actor in this is all of us, right? But, but do you, do you see any differences, say, by b millennials or, or teenagers, or did you not even get into that? Not, not, to, not, not really. I mean, I think, I think it's sort of, unfortunately, it's kind of, a, um, it's true across, across generations. Yeah. And one thing that's just, it's interesting, um, the one word you hear a lot from threat mongers and people who play threats is complex. The world is supposedly much more complex than ever before. It's, the Cold War was easy. Yeah, the good guys and the bad guys is very simple. And I, I try to think to myself, 
was it really simple when literally a, a brush fire conflict here could result in a nuclear conflict, which means the use of would wipe out everybody on Earth? That, that's considered easier than today, in which none of the challenges that we face rise to the same level. The stakes are nowhere near as high. You think about North Korea, you talk about Iran. I mean, th these are issues to be dealt with, but the threat level is not even in the same ballpark as what we dealt with during the Cold War. I'm not going to call uh, the, your analysis complex, but it is nuanced. Right? It is nuanced, uh, yes. Because you are not dismissive of all threats, right? There right. are still things that the United States and American citizens ought to be worried about, such as? Well, threats are constructed, right? So nobody gets, a, uh, gets to be the judge on determining what's threatening. And there's a, a bias called naive realism, which is the belief that I see the world objectively, everyone else who disagrees with me is misinformed or biased. <laughs> so we all think we see the world That's correctly. That's a great term, too, by yeah. the way. That is a good term. Um, is but really we do nice face term. very real threats. And this was uh, documented last November when the CDC announced that life expectancy in the United States has declined for three years in a row. Mm -hmm. This has not happened in a century, basically since the Spanish flu in World War I was ravaging uh, whole huge parts of the world. This is primarily due to a tripling of drug deaths over the last 10 years. Uh, the suicide rate has gone up 22% in the last 15 years in the United States. All-time suicide and drug deaths last year. So the threats that we face are absolutely getting worse, and they're all domestic. But these are, these are not traditionally thought of as national security issues. Right, and that's part of what we're in the book, as they should be. Um, you know, because, uh, the interesting thing about, about drug overdoses, we wrote this article in 2012, the first, the first iteration of this argument. We didn't even mention drugs, because it wasn't an issue that was really a national emergency at that mm -hmm. point. Today, right. uh, or I should say today, last year, 70,000, more than 70,000 Americans were killed, uh, died of drug overdoses, which is almost as many were killed by guns and cars combined. Mm. I mean, it's a, it's a stunning increase in a very short period of time. And um, another one we, we mentioned, I think we talked about obesity in, in, as it being a serious public health issue, it was around 32% of Americans were obese. For the book, we, the numbers, we had to update them, because now it's 40%. So the question as to why this is a national security challenge, first of all, um, if, if people are living shorter lives, um, th that does speak to sort of their, their life experience and, their, and you know, the, the quality of their life, and certainly not that great. But there's also an economic productivity issue, an economic issue with this. I mean, when you're spending hundreds of billions of dollars on fighting drug overdoses um, when you, or on uh, medical costs associated with obesity um, or uh, any number of diseases that, that weaken productivity, that keep people home from work, that keep, cause them to be more depressed. Um, all of that has an effect on, on, the, on the larger economy and all of that undermines sort of the economic foundations of American power. Uh, if, you have an, if you have a country in which people live shorter lives, lives that are more, that are more anxious, more, where they're more depressed, where they have more health issues, where they have less happiness, um, all of that's going to affect your, your bottom line economy, and that's what's happening in the United States. We're, we're not nearly as innovative as economy. We're not nearly as productive an economy as we once were, and I think a lot of it has to do with some of these issues we're talking about. So you mentioned drug overdoses and suicides as a factor in, in decreased longevity. Sure. The good news there, and again, this is sort of hidden in all that, the good news, as it were, is there are more efforts now, both locally and nationally, to address both drug overdoses and suicide than there probably have ever been. But not nearly at the level that they should be. Not nearly at the level they should be. I'm not arguing that at all. But I'm saying there has been a positive reaction right. to this from local health departments, from university research, from the federal government itself. That again, kind of, you know, again, if it bleeds, it leaves. Look, we don't live as long because of all these horrible things. Lost is, but we are, to an extent at least, not enough addressing I'll that. I'll just point out by comparison, on 9-11, 2,700 U.S. citizens died. The response to 9-11 to date has cost $3.8 trillion. $3.8 trillion? Trillion. trillion dollars. Oh, my Lord. By 2056, it'll be over $7 trillion. We will be paying for the how we conducted and financed the Iraq and Afghanistan wars into the 23rd century. So what we did to prevent 2,700 deaths is nothing compared to what we do uh, uh, I mean, what we do for drugs is nothing compared to what we do in, in terms of counterterrorism and war fighting. Um, so I agree there's more being done. But if you think about national security in terms of how do we protect people's lives? How do we protect people from the harms and the threats and the risks that they suffer? Um, there's so much more that we can and we should do because we know what works. That's the great story. We I have evidence-based interventions. We know exactly what works. We've got about a minute and a half left. I'm curious how you see, so you, you've, you've, you've sort of stuck your flag in the ground here. How's this, how, what do you expect to happen in the 2020 debate? Is, is, are we, should we expect more fear-mongering or will reason prevail? 
No, we'll expect, I mean, well, hopefully reason prevails, but we'll certainly get a lot of <laughs> um, You know, we have, look, we have a president who basically is trying to kick people off of health insurance, who wants to cut food stamps, who wants to put more money in the military. This is exactly the argument in the book that we say is, has caused us to be in the situation that we're in right now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, ideally the debate it would be people sort of pointing out that unless we are strong at home, unless we have a stronger economy and a stronger uh, um, um, labor force, we're not going to be a great power anymore. At the same time, if we're not engaged internationally, the, the issues that we have seen such progress on, we're not going to see that, that continue. Yeah. We're going to see a step backward. Do you see anybody who's going to make that case? I mean, I hope, I hope they all make that case. I don't think the president will make that case, and, and that I'm pretty sure about. Yeah. Part, part of this will have to do with how the media decides to amplify what stories. And one of the most disappointing things in the last debate was the Commission on Presidential Debates. Uh, if you look at the questioning that they did around national security and foreign yeah. policy, it was not just lazy, but it inhibited, I would say, I'm sorry, it both amplified and extended fear-mongering. It basically lobbed fear-mongering uh, softballs to all the presidential candidates, which they all jumped on. So they have a role to frame and provide the context for how Americans perceive the world, and hopefully they take advantage of it this time. And it, it's not just the debates, it's daily reporting. It, 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 sure. Guys, this is a tremendous book. Congratulations. Yes. Sure. Michael Cohn and Micah Zenko. The book is Clear and Present Safety. I enjoyed it. You should check it out. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. We can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.